Welcome to this Schooling Online production. This lesson will go through an overarching theme that shapes Julius Caesar, power. Shakespeare takes an actual historical event and uses it to pose relevant questions for his context regarding political power and how it can be wielded by good or bad leaders. He also asks us to consider the extent to which absolute power can corrupt a man, as well as exploring the chaos that can result when a power vacuum forms. In other words, what happens when a leader dies and there is no clear successor. It's a pretty complicated topic, but hang in there. Let's begin by looking at what Shakespeare is suggesting about how good and bad leaders wield power and how this power affects them. To do this, start by examining the character of Julius Caesar himself. Shakespeare's characterization of Caesar is interesting because he presents a man who is at a crossroad, a point in his life where he has so far been a good leader, but is faced with the temptation to grab total power and become king. This is concerning as it could potentially plunge Rome back into the bad old days of a single, tyrannical ruler. Let's look at the text to see how Shakespeare shows us the temptation Caesar faces and the dire consequences it could have. From the beginning of the play, it is clear that Caesar is a charismatic and successful leader. The opening scene is staged to show the celebrations that are being held by the citizens to celebrate Caesar's military victory over his enemy, Pompey. The citizens are hanging decorations on statues of Caesar to show how much they love him. But not everyone is happy. Two tribunes are angered by this display and demand that they take down the decorations. Morales fires a number of powerful rhetorical questions at the citizens in an attempt to shame them. Remember, rhetorical questions are questions that don't expect an answer. They make the speech more dramatic. He asks, You cruel men of Rome! Knew you not Pompey? And do you now put on your best attire? And do you now cull out a holiday? He's reminding them of how, only recently, Pompey was an ally of Caesar and someone whom they loved. Look how quickly the tide can change. The scene ends with Flavius explaining his concern about the level of power that Caesar is wielding. He decides to take down the decorations from Caesar's statues, declaring, These growing feathers plucked from Caesar's wing will make him fly an ordinary pitch. The metaphor of plucking the feathers from a bird to control how high it can fly illustrates his desire to control Caesar's popularity and ego. He is worried that otherwise Caesar would become too powerful and keep us all in servile fearfulness. In other words, Romans would become like slaves to Caesar. Remember that a principle of the Roman Republic was that all men had a say in the way they were governed. This means that they are free men rather than slaves. You can see why they would be worried about returning to the past. While there is some concern about Caesar's potential to become corrupted by power at the beginning, Shakespeare never really paints Caesar as a tyrant. Rather, Shakespeare is concerned with the potential of power abuse by Caesar once he's crowned king. In Act 1, Scene 2, Brutus is horrified by Casca's retelling of recent events when the crowd tried to crown Caesar as king. Casca notes that while Caesar refuses the crown three times, he seems to have been tempted to take it. He describes the way Caesar was very loath to lay his fingers off it and that it had almost choked Caesar. This is incredibly worrying. Cassius builds on this worry using a simile, which is a technique where something is described as being like something else. He says, Why, man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus. The Colossus of Rhodes was a huge statue of a man who stood high above the seaport in Rhodes and was one of the ancient wonders of the world. By comparing Caesar to the Colossus, 
Cassius is comparing him to one of the largest, most spectacular things in the world at that time. It would be like comparing someone in today's world to the Statue of Liberty or the Eiffel Tower. Cassius adds a tone of menace, saying, We petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonourable graves. Cassius here is pointing out that Caesar will use his absolute power to crush those below him. The idea of power corrupting a leader is developed further in Act 2, Scene 1, during Brutus's soliloquy, where he privately shares his innermost thoughts with the audience. Here, Shakespeare shows us the way a good leader should use power, as Brutus weighs up the pros and cons of assassinating Caesar. He explains that he wants to protect the Republic and the citizens of Rome, and that crowning Caesar would put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. The metaphor of Caesar being like a poisonous predator shows that he could use his absolute power to harm those he governs. This is reinforced by the simile at the end of his speech, which compares Caesar to a serpent's egg, which, when hatched, would unleash a poisonous snake on the citizens of Rome. While Brutus cannot find any specific evidence of Caesar becoming a tyrant, he examines the general effect of power on the characters of men and comes to the conclusion that the destruction of the Republic is inevitable if Caesar is crowned. Shakespeare continues to examine the differences between the way a good or a bad leader wields their power by contrasting the characters of Brutus and Cassius. Remember the final scene of the play where Antony describes Brutus as the noblest Roman of them all. Shakespeare characterises him as a good man. Brutus truly believes in the protection of the Republic and the Roman people, which is why he eventually joins Cassius's murder plot. He uses the metaphor that ambition's debt is paid to show that the killing of Caesar was necessary to stop Rome falling into the hands of a tyrant. Brutus's inner struggle is also given a personal dimension when he tries to decide whether he should betray his friend in favour of the Republic. He personifies this struggle when he describes being with himself at war. This is juxtaposed with the contrasting, or different, character of Cassius, who is clearly in it for himself. Cassius is envious of the power that Caesar has and the love the populace has for him. Antony notes this way too late in the final scene of the play when he says that all the conspirators, except for Brutus, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. Rather than giving him noble speeches to explain his thoughts, like Brutus does, Shakespeare has Cassius explain his plans through sneaky conversations with other characters, often behind Brutus's back. Remember in Act 1, Scene 2, when he compares Brutus metaphorically to a piece of metal that may be wrought? He plots to manipulate one of Brutus's most honourable character traits, his loyalty to Rome, in order to get what he wants. In the following scene, He asks Cinna to throw letters he has forged into Brutus's room to make him think that many citizens are concerned about Caesar's growing power. He proves from the very beginning how dangerous it is when people with dark motives are able to manipulate their way into power. Shakespeare also deals with the idea of power vacuums and warns us of the dangers that this situation poses. Remember, Shakespeare wrote this play when Elizabeth I was quite elderly and had no heirs. There were very real fears that England would spiral into bloody civil war if she suddenly died. It had happened before. As Antony notes in Act 3, Scene 1, the spirit of the murdered Caesar will let slip the dogs of war, and he uses graphic imagery of carrion men groaning for burial to predict 
the bloody battle that will be waged in the final act of the play. By having the brutal deaths of key characters happening on stage, Shakespeare shows us the terrible damage that the power vacuum resulting from the death of Caesar has caused. Still, it is important to note that the future isn't bleak at the end of the play. Order is restored in the final scene when the conspirators are defeated and Octavius, the named successor of Caesar, is victorious. Antony is instrumental in securing this victory through the persuasive power of language, his rhetoric as much as his skill on the battlefield. Shakespeare traces the way rhetoric can be used to achieve power throughout the play, most notably in Act 3, Scene 2, when Antony delivers the eulogy for Caesar. He begins by using inclusive terms, which are words that establish a connection and relationship with the audience. He says, friends, Romans, countrymen. He also uses rhetorical devices such as repetition to suggest to the crowd that Brutus and his friends did not have a legitimate reason to kill Caesar. Note how he repeats the word ambition, that Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is an honourable man. This starts raising questions in the minds of the crowd about the true nature of both Brutus and Caesar. By the end of this speech, the conversation amongst the citizens shows that they are convinced by his argument. Their opinion on Caesar is that, tis certain he was not ambitious. Antony's rhetoric is powerful in convincing both the crowd and even the audience that he and Octavius are good and noble leaders set to lead Rome into a new future. Ultimately, the play is a thoughtful examination of the dangers of desiring power and an exploration of how people who hold power should act. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on Julius Caesar, check out our analysis of the theme of appearance versus reality in the play.